So, Jeremy, how short are you? I am uh, 6'3". Nice. Yeah. I remember uh, seventh grade when I was that <laughs> short. <laughs> uh, so, how tall are you? 6'11". 6'11". So, I'll challenge you to horse. And when is the next time you're in Chicago? It's... Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have big Jason Henderson. He's already given me a hard time on how short I am. He's one of the most experienced email marketers online today. He's written the emails and come up with all of the email marketing strategy behind some of the biggest product launches in internet history like Main Street Marketing Machines Fusion for Mike Koenigs and Traffic Geyser. He has John Carlton and the CEO of Revolution Golf and many more people singing his praises, which I will ask about. And he created the course Email Response Warrior. And I love the first sentence, Jason, of this, uh, of the email page. People have to check it out just for the copy and for the design images. Uh, if you want to know how to easily and instantly increase the response to every single email you send, regardless of the niche, then this is the most valuable course you've ever seen. Jason, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, I'm excited. And, you know, I like to go through some fun facts first, but I have to ask, um, you said a, a couple things on the document, and one is, which I thought was intriguing, was you've been doing email marketing since 1996 just after al gore invented the internet yes. yeah so what was it like when you were what were you doing on the, on email in 1996 um i had done the bulletin board systems back in the day for a couple of years mm -hmm. and then in college my last senior year of college in oregon um i got a little more into it got a little more excited about the possibilities and um, after my senior year, I went to Australia to play professional basketball. You know, I, I know it's hard to imagine at 6'11", but, um, and then, but it was really laid back in Australia. There's like maybe one or two practices a week and like average one game a week. So a All lot right. of free time. And I just started going to the local college. And uh, they said, yeah, you come on over to the computer lab and then there's a free seat. You can use it. So like. Five to six days a week, I was going there just viewing web pages and tinkering around. And a company in Texas hired, hired me to do some web stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. And, um, and then I started my own website, Body by Jason, you know, out, ripped off Body by Jake. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was a nationally certified personal trainer yeah. in the U.S. And I started doing it again in Australia just because I enjoyed doing it. So started this website and I started building a list and writing emails and um, the about.com uh, noticed me and they had just kicked off or the exercise guide for them quit and so they asked me if I would do that so hmm. I said yes in 1996 so that was my probably my big start right there because um, you know they're they have, I don't know about right now but Back then, they had like over 800 guides on every topic you can imagine. Yeah. And if you're old school like me, you you probably remember them as the mining company. They later changed their name to about.com. Um, so that that was a big experience. They always brought in a lot of experts on SEO, uh, building traffic, and how to write engaging articles, but never on email. The only thing they ever told me about on email was just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And so I just naturally took to that and said, okay. And I just went from there. Yeah. And you, you know, are basically a religious attender of the Marketing Sherpa Email Summit, uh, the world's largest email conference. How did you even discover that? What was it like early on going to those? Um, so my first introduction to the IM world was um, Armin Morin, Alex Mendozian. You know, they had the big seminar days and uh, they, they mentioned Dan Kennedy. So I started checking out Dan Kennedy, who I later found out was, I was basically learning Gary Halbert from Dan Kennedy and uh, not everything, but some of the stuff. And then, um, then I started to hear from time to time this company called Marketing Sherpa and then uh, later Mech Labs. Yeah. And um, so I was like, huh. So I checked them out. And the same year that 
I discovered, oh, I attended my first Dan Kennedy conference. I attended my first Marketing Sherpa email summit because yeah. I really started to get um, big with email and started working with a lot of big clients then in 2006. And uh, so I figured it was, you know, the next logical thing is to go and hang out with email marketers. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you spoke one year too. What did you speak on? Uh, I spoke on uh, affiliate email marketing and developing relationships with your partners and getting them to promote and how to treat them and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And so what were some big takeaways from, I and mean, you've been going for 10 years, what are some of the times that you think back that were so valuable that if you didn't go, you wouldn't know some of the stuff? Uh, from the very, the very first time they had it, they had a panel with the, the deliverability guys from AOL, um, Yahoo, uh, some of the leading experts, and I just had this round table, and you could ask them questions. And I just kept on asking, and I was like, and, and <laughs> like, here goes Jason again. And uh, I just couldn't get enough. And they were just telling me all the stuff that I had, uh, you know, I wondered about. They just contradicted everything that I had heard. Like what? Um, like, as far as uh, plain text gets better deliverability, totally wrong. Uh, images hurt deliverability totally wrong. Um, you know, more about engagement versus just content. How, you know, just using the word free is not going to really hurt you that bad. Uh, and the suggestion that you should misspell words was totally wrong and gave you a bit better prob probability of getting into the spam folder by doing that. So a lot of stuff that, you know, plain text, images, and misspelling words is stuff that you know you still hear sometimes today mm -hmm. yeah uh, yeah uh, and it's never been true um so yeah that was that was really eye opening and uh i also you know i learned a lot about thinking differently you know thinking more about the customer perspective versus my perspective um they talked a lot about value proposition um they didn't really invent that Russell Reeves did in the 50s but they studied him and Claude Hopkins, a unique selling pro proposition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came away with a lot, a lot of different perspectives on how to approach things, um, testing. You know, just naturally I was doing things pretty good on my own, but mm -hmm. uh, just from things about testing I learned from them, I was able to ramp up my response for myself and clients even more. Yeah. So, how do you, Jason, get in the mind? Because that's a good one. Um, you know, get in the mind of the customer. How do you do that? What methods do you uh, use to, to better connect with them? Sure. Um, this is a lot of people now are saying, um, this is just one example. A lot of people are saying now open rates don't matter. You can't deposit open rates at the bank. Totally not true. <laughs> um, the better you get at targeting the right person for the right message at the right time. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways you can do that is by how you craft your open rates. You know, you have the opportunity to make a lot more money in some cases. Yeah. Not every time. It, it's not that open rates don't matter. It's large open rates don't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of my best emails ever, over 166,000 opens, wow. um, made a ton of money. And it, we'll talk about it a little bit later, yeah. but just a lot of that. Um, Who are some of your question? favorite speakers uh, at, uh, that have been at Marketing Sherpa? Um, the director of Mech Labs, that's Marketing Sherpa's parent company, uh -huh. uh, Dr. Flint McLaughlin. Okay. And uh, he's got an interesting background. He was back, you know, thinking about this stuff back in, I think, 95, 94. Yeah. And he actually had his uh, PhDs in philosophy. Hmm. So that's where the different change in mindset comes along. I that's see. that's their big thing yeah. is philosophy and how you approach yeah. things, yeah. which I like. And yeah. uh, so he had, a, he had a lot of great quotes that are like really resonated with me. Um, yeah. Save some of those because I know that you have some for the mentor. You know, I'm going to ask about the mentors. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of your fun facts for a second. You know, we'll talk okay. about email marketing. But you, you're like an interesting, quirky guy. Like I thought I was quirky, actually. And uh, nope. a couple, you know, you love bunny rabbits is one and use them in your marketing. So what do you, what do, you do with them in your marketing? 
Uh, you know, pictures. Um, they write emails for me sometimes. They threaten people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I just. What's I your use highest them. converting bunny picture? Highest converting bunny picture. Yeah. Um, hmm. That might have been the one where I was having an argument with my girl bunny, uh, Piggly Wiggly, and it was for a Christmas promo, so she was Santa, um, Santa Piggly Wiggly, and she wanted to give my list a, a huge discount that I thought that was outrageous, and she threatened to mount me and <laughs> do all kinds of horrible things if I didn't give him an extra discount, so that was probably one of the better ones. It's funny, yeah. I mean, it got to, go ahead. Uh, it, I took it actually to an email summit uh, in Miami, yeah. and uh, Stefan Pollard, uh, unfortunately recently passed mm. a couple years ago, um, reviewed it, and he said he couldn't recommend a single thing. It was that good. Um, so I naturally used bunnies from the get-go because they said, you know, have a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation. Like, okay, so what do I do normally? It's like, you know, I show pictures. I show, I talk about my bunny rabbit. Um, you know, I talk about my family. I show pictures of my family. So I naturally did that. But yeah. with the bunnies, it went even further one day. Um, I built this bunny sanctuary in my home office, <laughs> you know. A little cage is not good enough for bunnies, okay? They're meant to hop around and mount and all that stuff. Yeah. So I had two bunnies, and uh, one was a boy, one was a girl. Piggly Wiggly was the girl, and I was listening to Dan Kennedy, and all of a sudden I heard this rustling in the back, and I turned around, and Piggly Wiggly was mounting her little brother. And I was like, Piggly Wiggly, stop it. Um, leave your little brother alone because, you know, bunnies, they mount not, uh, for dominance, you know, they want to be the boss bunny, um, which I want to be the boss bunny, too, in uh, the marketplace. Stay away from you, then. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, figuratively speaking. Yeah. And, uh, but then I was like, well, hold on a second. I said, I, I guess it's true. Listening to Dan Kennedy does help you multiply your uh, income like rabbits. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I took it to the never, another level and I started using them even more. So you the whole still dominance and multiplying. Do you still have bunnies today? I don't. I don't know. Me, my, my wife and I were living in Las Vegas, and uh, we're considering where we're going to make our permanent Warren. I mean, uh, you know, house our living arrangement. Yeah. And uh, once we do that, we'll probably get two more bunnies. Yeah. And that's an interesting story too. Another fun fact of how you met your wife. Oh yeah, that's people find that extremely odd. So I'm here in Las Vegas, living by myself. I believe it was soon after the Mike Koenig launch. And uh, I was doing private one-on-one -on -one sessions with the MMA fighter, Muay Thai. Um, I used to be a personal trainer, so I had some really intense uh, ab and core workouts. So I had done three Muay Thai sessions. Mm -hmm. I had just done my uh, killer ab and core workout. And it was a Saturday, and I don't know, belly dance always just intrigued me, the way they moved their body, how sensual it was, and I'm always thinking about it, but never did it. And so I went to the gym, and I, may, I thought maybe I was just going to do some cardio and some stretching. As I needed to recover from those three intense Muay Thai workouts, the ab workouts, and I saw that there was a belly dance class about to start. I was like, huh. I said, today's my day off. You know, I need to take it easy. Belly dance is probably, you know, nothing. So I hopped into class, and uh, my future wife immediately was on the defensive because typically only, um, let's just say, guys that play for uh, you know the same team, yeah. you would say, yeah. um, you know, go to her class. So she immediately thought to herself, "Hmm, he doesn't seem gay." And uh, she, so she, her litmus test was she was going to offer me a sash to put around my waist. And I immediately said, okay. And I took it, put it on, and it was one of the hardest workouts I've ever done. I was like almost in tears. It really? hurt so bad. Yeah. My abs, my core, it was burning. And I wasn't even doing it close to right. I was just trying it. And um, 
she she remarked afterwards she's like she's like yeah you need some practice she's like but at least you got rhythm that's all you need and uh it went from there I mean, you couldn't get further from, you know, different Muay Thai boxing and then belly dancing. <laughs> yeah. That was funny. Um, and so I want to give people a quick win, uh, Jason. What's a quick win that someone could start doing right now to improve their email marketing messages? Sure. Um, I would say learn how to use, effectively use images in their emails. You know, not just half-ass, not just because, not a little clip art, but really connect with people. Uh, there's a million ways you can use images for rapport. Uh, you're showing your personality, building the relationship, connecting on a personal basis, uh, showing proof, credibility, trust, uh, storytelling, um, the most powerful form of proof, according to Gary Benzavenga, is demonstration. You can actually use that in your images. And uh, we, all, we all know about Gary Halbert's grabbers in direct mail, same thing. Um, but you really want to use images that I refer to as direct response, that actually have a purpose, mm -hmm. not just willy-nilly putting it in there. Um, but even though it's not going to be like huge, oh, it increased, you know, revenue by X or increased click-throughs by Y, I, I think it's amazing the way you can personally connect with people and be transparent, reveal real things and connect on a personal level just by using what I refer to as rapport images, like oh, yeah. you and your bunny or you and your wife or you and your kids, stuff like that. Yeah. So what besides the bunny images, what are, have been some good images that you've used in the email? Uh, action images, um, like say for golf, you know, actually, uh, you know, golfing out on the course um, before and after. Uh, there was, I did a mole remover that did extremely well. Um, uh, screenshots of revenue going through the roof. I did that for finance. Mm -hmm. That increased click-through rate by 27%. Wow. Um, and then now, now it's pretty much, except for Outlook, which will show the first frame, most email clients will show animated images now. And I've been doing, doing a lot of testing with that. So you can actually... You know, even with just a few frames, really demonstrate your product in the email. Hmm. So, why why did it, the misconception come about with plain text versus images and images not delivering? Did they right. did they address that at all? The the every single year, I like I ask the same questions every single year because I kept on hearing the same thing, mm -hmm. and some like didn't even feel like it deserved to answer. It was just like, who the hell thinks that? What? It was just insane to them that people would think that. Um, I don't know where it came either. Probably the first place that I saw this was before AdSense went away um, and the people knew it. I was suckered into buying an AdSense product, you know, make a zillion dollars with AdSense. Not that it went away entirely, but it just wasn't as big as yeah, before. right. And um, so on the recording, the author was saying, oh, yeah, you know, using images next to the links increases click-through rates by crazy. And uh, someone asked him, was like, oh, so do you use images in emails? And he goes, oh, no, I don't know. You don't, do, don't use images in emails. That'll kill your deliverability. And I don't know. He heard it from someone. It just got passed down. Yeah. So what are some other misconceptions that you learned at the, uh, at the conference that maybe is, is common thought but is completely untrue? Sure. Um, one of the big ones right now is that you can't scientifically test an email, um, which is ridiculous. So basically I hear a lot of things like, you know, oh, you got all these different variables that have, will affect the val validity and all that stuff. But – you can test the email scientifically just as much as you can test a landing page. Landing pages have a lot of different validity threats as well. Like you, you shouldn't send organic traffic and paid traffic to the same landing page because mm -hmm. that'll affect it. You shouldn't send yeah. hyper customers and prospects to the same page because right. that'll screw it up. So it's basically the same. You just have to know what can affect the validity of the tests. And 
besides, and the, the point is that I've actually learned from attending all these summits that even if we're true, it really doesn't matter because that's not the main purpose of testing, scientifically or otherwise. The main purpose is to learn about your customer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you shouldn't go to a test and say, okay, you know, A beat B, version A beat, beat version B, version B beat version A, and be like, okay, I'm just going to use version B now. No, you should be thinking, you know, why? Mm. Why did that happen? Right. What's the, what's the thought process? Yeah. What's going on behind the scenes? You got to document it. Yeah. Um, so that's a big thing. That's a great way of looking at it. I think most people just go, oh, this converted. I'm going to use this. And they don't think of right. the psychology of why this actually worked and how you could better learn. So what's something that you found out that you did learn about your customer because of your tests? That was important. Yeah, it, it's one of them big was Revolution Golf. Um, it wasn't about the the price. That's what I discovered. Um, the big discount, the big deal. It was a more about the offer. It was like what's what's in it for them. Mm -hmm. That's one of the great things about emails is that you can test those assumptions. What's the driving force? You know why. Are your prospects and customers buying and the cool thing is that you can actually apply it to different places you can then apply it um, say like for open rates you can find what really triggers uh, your customers to open mm -hmm. and then apply it to headlines and all throughout the checkout process mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions about that later on too sure. um, but so how did you know that you said they didn't care that much about price but more was more what was offered how did you discover that? Because you gleaned it from something in your testing. It may not be obvious to most people. Uh, it was version A versus version B. Yeah. Version A was all about the offer, what's in it for them, had a lot, uh, lot of bullets. And version B was all about unbelievable deal, mm. super discounts, you'll never get at this price again. And like I said, version A was all about, you know, what's what it's, it's going to do. Yeah. How did you even come up with the two versions, though? Because most people would have, oh, I'm going to do a version with this headline and I'll do a version with this other headline. But you had two completely different topics that you were testing. How did you even decide to do that? Uh, just just from Mech Labs. I've taken their online testing and their value proposition development certifications like probably three to five times each. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just, you know, they're always em emphasizing that. Yeah. And um, I forget it sometimes. And that's why I like to keep on going back because I'm always reminded of stuff. And so I really wanted to know what was the drive, what mattered most to them. Was it the price or what, what was in it for them? So, you know, I just looked at it as like, you know, how can I increase the response here? And, uh, and I came up with that. Yeah. So it says a lot about you that you keep going back because at this point, you'd be like, I've been 10 years. <laughs> I know enough. So what brings you back this year? What do you want to get out of this year? Um, I want to learn. I always like the reminder, like I said, of yeah. stuff that uh, maybe I've been slacking on. Uh, just new ideas, new, new ideas to test, new thought processes. Because a lot of people will go like, well, why, why do you want to go there? You know, it's all corporate. It's like people are people. I was people. looking at the speakers, yeah. I was like, hmm, okay, I checked it out. And it is... They're all corporate speakers, you know, the people right. handling big, big companies campaign. I mean, we can learn a lot from that. So sure. Yeah. People are people. I mean, they're trying to get people to opt into their list. They're testing different incentives. Um, they're trying to reduce friction. They're trying to figure out what people, their customers want. Yeah. So it's all like Dr. Flint always goes on rants and he says, there is no such thing as an email. There's no such thing as a landing page. All right, there's only thought processes, okay? We are optimizing thought processes, not emails, not landing pages. And uh, that really resonates with me. Mm -hmm. um, really gets into the philosophy and the psychology like you were saying before. And um, so I'm just always looking for different ways to for behavioral segmentation, segmentation yeah. in general, personalization, uh, different ways to you know, you know, figure out you know, why my prospects and customers and why my clients prospects and customers say yes and do more of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. And that 
I, we'll talk about that when you talk about your mentors a little bit. But um, I want to go back a little bit and find out about the early days, where you're from, what was it like growing up, and who was a big inspiration influence on you early on? Sure. So I grew up in the valley in Los Angeles, not Silicon Valley, the uh, the real valley, <laughs> like no way, man, like for sure. So did you um, surf then? Are you surfing? No, no. I went to the beach a lot, but I really didn't surf. You know, I'm kind of a giant, so it's a little hard to balance. <laughs> I tried once. I, I'd try again, but my first try did not go well. And so who was a big inspiration influence growing up? Uh, I would say my dad. It's He's basically affected uh, all my relationships relationships, and my current relationship with my wife, yeah. my lovely wife, uh, Debbie, who I affectionately refer to as Little Bunny. And uh, so growing up, um, I still remember it today vividly. Every single day, my dad would come home, and the first thing he'd immediately do, he'd go to my mom and uh, give her a kiss, and most of the time, he'd have flowers wow. with him. And uh, he's always a gentleman, opening up the car door, the restaurant door, hmm. any type of door we're going through, making sure she wasn't cold, and uh, always showed her a lot of respect. So that really influenced me a lot. That's amazing. So flowers, he puts everyone to shame. <laughs> yep <laughs> so what did he do uh he was an accountant okay and so, he on the weekends he would go in for these cattle calls and he was an extra for a lot of commercials and tv shows and movies really yeah that that influenced me too what made him do that he just had interest in acting or yeah, I was just a way to make extra money, mm -hmm. um, something fun to do. Yeah, um, I think just, uh, I don't know, a friend of his just suggested it to him. Who was but, a big influence business-wise for you? Or did, you know, because obviously you have this entrepreneur spirit inside you. Were you doing anything from a young age in that realm? No. Uh, I mean... I did uh, carpet cleaning and clean office buildings, um, but that really didn't teach me any entrepreneurial skills, except it sucks to work for the man. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good lesson, though. Yeah. And the guy that I was working with, he actually, one time, I was in the back of his truck, and I don't know what he was thinking, but he, he took off while I was standing in the front of the bed of the truck. That's horrible. And I slid standing all the way to the back, wow. and I flipped over. And I was hanging on by, you know, at oh the my. knee. And he was driving down the street. <laughs> That's like out of a was, movie. Yeah, I was screaming. I was 13 and people were staring. <laughs> and he finally turns around because people are screaming and yelling at him. And he turns around and laughs. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> and, he, and he gypped me on my pay. So that was, I guess that was a good lesson. So did you want to be a pro basketball player when you were younger? Um, no, not really. No. I went to a small uh, private religious school because my mom taught there. My high school coach was the school gardener <laughs> who never played high school ball. He wanted to, but he was no not good enough to make it. So it was not the best experience. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, it wasn't until later when I got to college when I said, you know, I think I can do this. And yeah, I think that would be a great life. So you played in college? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then you went on to play pro basketball in Australia. Yeah, I played in uh, Australia, Germany, El Salvador, Honduras, and China. So how was it? How was the, the life of a pro basketball player overseas? It was nice. You're basically a rock star. And uh, in Australia, it was coincided with um, my episode of Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Yeah, tell um, about that. I used to watch yeah. that show, and I actually saw him live do a comedy. Uh, Mark Curry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in between my college years, I was doing some acting and modeling back in the day, and uh, one of my big things was co-starring an episode of Hang With Mr. Cooper called High Hopes with um, Raven Simone was on it, Nell Carter, mm -hmm. Holly Robinson-Pete. And uh, so, yeah, that, that was a blast. Um, my dad took me to one of the cattle calls, and um, I had done plays in high school uh, since sixth grade. And my wife, um, she's always very disturbed whenever I'm doing an interview and she wants to put 
so a little bit of makeup on and I get this big grin on my face and I really enjoy it. <laughs> it's like, you're enjoying this too much. It's like, I was doing plays in you sixth have a sensitive grade. sensitive side. You like bunnies, you're, you know, you, you, you had a role model, your dad who gave flowers to your mom every day. So, yeah. And um, so, yeah, that was, that was awesome. So it couldn't, me going to Australia coincided with the first um, airing of the show in Australia. Like, oh, wow. Basically, the same week I was arriving, it played. So right when I got there, people were like, oh, my gosh, this you know, giant American basketball player is going to save our team. And, oh, my gosh, he's an actor. Um, so, yeah, it's, it was basically like a rock star. But everywhere I went, you know, it was just people thought it was awesome. They love pro basketball. They love Americans. So, yeah, it was, it was pretty fun. So were your teammates mostly American or were they from all over? No. No, when I, Australia, they were all Australian except for uh, one other American. Um, in China, there was another American and no one spoke English except for uh, the assistant on the team. Really? Uh, yeah, I hated that because for some reason, I thought he was kind of shady. I never knew if he was actually translating what <laughs> right. I said. He could what say whatever he wants. Yeah. yeah. Did you tell him what I told you to say? He's like, oh, yeah. I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't trust that. You're, and you said your real job was working the graveyard shift. What At a 24-7 like? yeah. tanning salon. So People what? like, who the, who the hell wants a tan in the middle of the night? And uh, let me us. tell you, yeah. all, all the crazy people you can think of. Uh, so you got people coming home from the club that are wasted um, on all kinds of things, whether it be alcohol or drugs. Um, you got the, the hookers. You got the porn stars. You got the porn directors. <laughs> it, it was a trip every single night. I never knew who was going to come in. So how, and, did you, how did you get to start? How did you start doing that? Um, I was just looking for, you know, additional income, you yeah. know, while I was, you know, wanting to finish my college career. Yeah. Um, I took a little while off to do the acting and stuff. And so that was kind of my start of really, you know, trying to figure out this whole marketing thing because I was working the graveyard shift. Mm -hmm. It was hourly plus commission on product sales. Uh, but the graveyard shift, you know, they had a huge rush between midnight and two and then early in the morning. Why? And then Why just, midnight and two? What's what's the rush midnight and two? <laughs> it's I guess the clubs. That's when uh, like people. If I come, if I'm going out to a bar, like the first thing I don't think of is I'm gonna go tanning. <laughs> why, why is that? What do you guys want to do? Uh, let's go get a tan. <laughs> right. That seems odd to me, but okay. Yeah, it, it boggled my mind. It was it was really weird. But uh, so I had less foot traffic during the day and, you know, I wasn't a perky blonde, you know, which help, probably helped sales a lot. So, you know, I just I was like, huh, man, I was like, what do, what do I have to do to make more sales uh, to maximize the little time I have with foot traffic? Yeah. So I don't know. It just came to me. I didn't have any marketing mentors. And uh, so I was like, hmm, what, could, what would I do that would make it buying products uh, from me in particular? Uh, you know, better. So I have, I have a decent memory. Um, so I memorized the prices of every single product and there was like 25 or so, and they all had different variations. Um, like and with what that, product, I, what kind of products were there? You know, lotions. Okay. Um, so you have the regular lotion for after tanning and then the lotion to, you know, make your skin darker during okay. and uh, stuff like that. And so it all kinds of, I thought it was all the same, but <laughs> all different kinds of variations and stuff. Um, so, and then I thought, I was like, I memorized the price for every single product. And uh, I forgot this notice. I actually memorized the, the price with tax of every single product, hmm. the, the price of every single variation of each product, and the difference in price, and actually the, the ounce difference. So wow. I was... You know, you sure you sure you really want to buy this? You know, the X size of lotion. You know, for just X amount more, you're gonna get you know 20 ounces, and you're gonna save X like that. So you know, this came to me, and it worked really well. And um, you know, I just you know, I thought about Cheers probably, 
is probably what happened. I thought about Cheers, you know, how everybody knows your name. Yeah. And so all the regulars that came in, I started uh, memorizing their names, their bed preference, their product preference. I just started greeting people. You know, you know hey, Susie, I got bed 13 ready for you. And um, so that, that was huge. And then I started recognizing, um, kind of like with the lotion and the different prices and sizes, um, I kind of noticed the people, the regulars that kept on coming over and over again, they were doing singles. And so I would point out to them, you know, how much they were uh, throwing away, which is kind of a good point too, versus car- you know, carrot versus stick. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, how much money you could be saving, but I think I focused more on how much they were throwing away by doing singles every single time versus getting a monthly recurring account. Mm-hmm. And uh, that worked really well. So that's probably actually my start of, uh, you know, developing my email marketing superpowers because a lot of that uh, translates to email as well, you know, personalization, segmentation, um, and all that good stuff. You got your early training in the tanning salon in the midnight shift. Who would have thought? Yeah, crazy. So anyone starting out should just go get the midnight shift at the tanning (laughs) salon and use some of these tactics. Um, So what was a big turning point for you in your career? Um... Probably in 2005 at the first email summit, um, I kind of got validation of what I had been doing. And I think the big difference, um, I've kind of heard it before from Robert Hirsch. I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Hirsch. Works with Mike Dillard in the mm-hmm. Elevation Group. I've seen Jedi him speak once. Yeah. yeah, he's run a ton of businesses. Um, he was at a Richard Branson mastermind on Necker Island. And um, this really young guy, I think like 25, and there were, people were amazed about how successful he was at such a young age. Um, and Robert's theory was the reason why you're so successful is that because you're so young, you haven't had anybody tell you what not to do. Mm. And so that was kind of like me. Um, I just you know have a personal one-on-one conversation. I used images from the get-go. Um, added a lot of personality and so going to the summit that kind of validated what I was doing and then I learned how to ramp that even more so I tell people you know, what kind of clients are you looking for and I'm mainly for the most part looking for successful clients who want to be more successful mm-hmm. so if you look at the big product launches I've done with uh, Mike Keeniggs and Mike Dillard and um, you know my consulting with Mind Valley, they're all hugely successful companies right. um, but they want to see what they can do more. And my training with Mech Labs and all the testing I've done, you know, for these 18 plus years really helps me um, excel in that area. Yeah. So, Jason, let's talk about some of the most successful campaigns okay. and why they worked. And uh, there's a John Carlton one. Oh, yes. So, yeah, I figured out that doing live events even back then was huge. 2009. Um, it was for an affiliate promo for a simple writing system. And the list we had was over 60,000. So, you, so you're thinking like, oh, of course, you know, you did well. You had a huge list. Um, because that is true. A lot of people do well because they have a huge list. I mean, they could say, buy this shit with a link and probably make a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> a certain percentage but, will buy, yeah. Right. But actually they only had an active list of 3,000 because um, they hadn't mailed it in over a year. Hmm. So they burned the list. And I I did a lot of um, reaching out, reviving um, amazing content, and figured out that we had 3,000 to work with. So like, okay. So how do you start reviving? What do you do? Um. I've done different versions throughout the years, but that back then was reason why. You know, they say reason why copy is one of the most powerful things you can do. It's basically the same thing. You know, here's why, um, and here's what I'm going to do about it, and here's what it's what's what's in it for you. Mm-hmm. And the best thing that I found is just doing a free no pitch uh, webinar. Uh, depending on if the product out there is an expert, it could just be simple as Q&A. That's mm-hmm. it. You don't have to think about it. You just say, what do you want to know? Come on and ask questions. Right. 
And um, so that's what I did, and uh, it worked really well. And so then it came time for the John Carlton promo, and uh, I used a lot of segmentation because we had customers and prospects. So the customers, I figured out, okay, these, these guys have bought the product. They're interested in X. The prospects, maybe they are, maybe they're not. So maybe I need a little, be more broad with them. But for the customers, I was very laser targeted. Um, you're interested in CPA marketing, PPC marketing. This is how the simple writing system is going. This is what it's going to do for you. Mm -hmm. Here, not what's in the simple writing system. This is what it's going to do for you. Um, and then I was a little more broad with that. And I did the huge um, uh, event with John Carlton himself, which he usually norm normally never does or hardly ever. Uh, a little more now, but not not really. And um, it was it like a webinar event or what? Or, yeah, yeah, yep. Webinar event and um, did live straight to the search engines, and we demonstrated actually what the customers wanted to do. And John was basically going through and showing them how they would do it. Uh, even better using a simple writing system. So it was huge, and uh, I came up with the killer bonus, which was another Q&A webinar um, with John, a Q&A webinar with the product author, and um, a recording that had never been released with the product author that he did at this huge event. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, finished uh, number five, um, and I beat a lot of top copywriters with huge lists. Love that, yeah. So the um, you have another one that uh, Stompernet you mentioned. Yes. So or before we go to Stompernet, anything else with the John Carlton one that any lesson take home lessons that people should get um, that aren't completely obvious from the story. Um. No, uh, you know, big bonus, um, segmentation, you know, laser targeted messages for different segments of your list. Um, if you have a general list, then that could be a problem right there. But if you have different, definitely have segments, um, you definitely want to target your emails. Yeah, yeah, because everyone wants to revive a list that they haven't mailed to or that's not responding. So that's a really good one. Um, right. so was in, in the scheme of things was stomper net next or was that before the, the John Carlton one? Um, well, there's stomper is two different things with that same three K list. I finished top 10 in a promoting stomper net, but then I actually went from this project project to actually working for stomper net and I did a big affiliate promo. Mm -hmm. Which one do you want? Oh yeah. Just start with whichever one was first. Um, the Stompernet was basically this, this similar to uh, the John Carlton. Mm -hmm. So I think we should probably go to the, the next one. Okay. Um, that one was the 2009 project um, ended, and I had done top 10 for Stompernet as well. And Brad Fallon, the CEO, had seen all the affiliate emails and all the launch emails. And so he basically got me to go to Atlanta, do the same thing for them. And the first affiliate promo that dropped on my lap was for uh, the original Main Street Marketing Machines promotion. And it was already going on. So um, we were late to the game. And uh, I just happened to be in Dallas for a Dan Kennedy conference, and Mike was speaking there. So at the last second, I pinged him and asked him to do a webinar with me. And... I got him to agree at the last second, and the manager of Stompernet told me not to send any emails without checking with him, but he was already in bed. It was like 11 uh, p.m. at night, and I just said, screw it. You know, I'll ask for forgiveness. Right. And uh, You got the so, opportunity. Right. Yeah. And so I sent out this email and uh, I don't think a lot of people, if any, were doing it back then. But I actually had figured out even back then 
how to use a one-click registration link for GoToWebinar. Hmm. Um, and like even before the I woke up, we had over 800 people registered. Wow. And then I sent up uh, some follow-up emails, and then we had you know thousands registered. And one of the things that a marketer on Facebook actually claimed, like, yeah, I'm the first one to use this. This works really well. And this was like last year was actually using a screenshot of how many people registered. Well, I used that way back then, then in 2010. Right. right. Um, you know, I, I sent a follow-up email to get people on saying, look. And I screenshot and I circled and it was like probably... 1,730 people registered for the webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, so that did huge. Good social proof, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so Mike came on and we did it in his hotel room and uh, made 45 sales. And then just with the follow-up, I used a lot of social proof. I used images. Not a lot of people. And Brad kept on replying to my email. I said, dude, no one is doing these things, man. These things are awesome. And uh, Mike Koenig was replying to me. He was like, dude, awesome job. He's like, I can't believe you, you did that. And uh, ended up doing like th over $327,000 in sales. Wow. Uh, I think we finished fifth just behind Frank Kern. Dang it. Um, yeah, it was, it was blockbuster. So it kind of goes back to, so you pinged Mike. Mm -hmm. and, and you used your email skills. What did you write to him that... You know, because he could have just as easily blown that off, blown you off. Right. So, so it kind of goes back to your email marketing skills of him actually, you know, pinging him to get him to do the webinar. What did you say? Uh, I'd I'd have to look, but yeah. uh, from what I can recall right now, I basically just said, uh, you know, here's why I'm going to do a one-click registration. I'm going to get mm -hmm. you know over a thousand people on the webinar, and we're going to make a ton of sales, and we're going to do it live. And I like. Who's doing it live right now on uh, webinars where we're in the same room? And, uh, you know, it's going to be cool. You know, we got a lot of talking points. We're at the Dan Kennedy Conference. And uh, he met with me and um, that day uh, for lunch and uh, agreed. Yeah. So I think the big key takeaway there is, um, you know, all he can say is no. So it's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. Most people are afraid. Yeah. And uh, you just have to have a good reason why. Yeah. What's in it for them. Yeah. And Jason, you know, Mike has a, a great marketing mind. What have you learned from him throughout the years that you've used in your marketing? Um, Mike, uh, just the power of live events, uh, the power of video, um, interaction, uh, making things interactive, uh, way more engaging, like, when I worked on his conference, uh, that was my first exposure to an actual live streaming event. Um, and uh, then I started recommending that in product launches and every single time it's been like huge gangbusters. It's done way better um, with than without. Mm -hmm. So the power of video and uh, making things more interactive. Mm -hmm. And I've been wanting to ask this one. Um, the I want to hear about the Revolution Golf launches. Justin Tupper. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the number one golf site. Um, yeah, so he pinged me one day on Facebook, and uh, he had been searching around Mech Labs and talking to people, and um, so I kept on hearing my name. And, uh, again, they were super successful, had a list of 2 million, um, doing really well had a lot of info products, and they just wanted to see what they could do to uh, do it even better. So he brought me on. Um, I wrote their daily email for six months, um, sometimes two, three, four, five emails in one day. Wow. Um, optimized all the landing pages and checkout process, and I ran all the product launches. And um, I actually ran their three biggest product launches in company history. Um, I think you've heard about the first one. That was the biggest product launch until I, I beat it. And the interesting thing there was the first one was with a huge superstar in the golf. It was uh, with Gary Player. He's, you know, probably top five all time. And um, so it did really well. And then we followed that up with a launch for Martin Chuck. He's a 
golf pro in Phoenix, and he's really good, but he's not ranked in, you know, top Reader's Digest or Golf Digest, you know, top ranked instructors. He's not ranked at all in anywhere. Um, it's kind of goofy. He'll, he'll, he'll make mistakes, and he won't edit it. He'll just be like, oops, and he'll just take the shot again. And uh, initially, my wife... <laughs> My wife is a golfer in the family, and she's her and my myself was like, "What? That's not very professional." It's like, do we, you know, is that really the best thing to do? And we talked to the C C O O Lisa of Revolution Golf, re- really cool gal, and she's like, "No, that's why people love him. They love it when he's he's real. He's, he's like real, them, yeah, yeah." And um, yeah, so. Justin didn't have high expectations. He, you know, he wanted it to do well, but there was just no expectation that it would do better than, you know, with Gary Player. And uh, so I had to come out swinging. And, um, you know, Gary Player, you know, he's, he's older and he's a super, you know, he's a legend. He's got all kinds of golf uh, course design stuff going on, speaking engagements. So the interaction with him, um, was limited. Yeah. And so with Martin, I used, again, because of my Kinex, used a lot of live events. That was the first time I used Hangouts. Um, straight from Google, no additional add ons. Um, and people went nuts. So what did you and, do? Uh, what did you do on Hangouts? Like- yeah, it was live instruction. And the first one, <laughs> uh, it wasn't his fault. You know, I was new to it. He was new to it. He thought it'd be cool to be out on the green. Um, but the lighting was the lighting was horrible, and he had this little MacBook, and it was grainy. And where is he put? Like a just on a table somewhere? Or what, what is well, that? his his golf course that he coaches at. Um, they had a really long. No, he used his MiFi, <laughs> Verizon MiFi. So it was a huge gamble, and there's maybe two, three people that are like, "What? This is crap! You promised us HD, blah blah blah." But 90, 98% of people were just, like, blown away. They're like, oh, my gosh, I'm watching, like, Martin Chuck live. This is, like, golf TV. And uh, it was huge. Tons of, tons and tons of sales. Um, and he was not happy about all the interaction that I was ha- forcing him to do, like, answering questions and interacting. And we did, like, four events. And, uh, yeah, we – we totally blew the uh, previous launch out of the water. What did he want to do? Just hit golf balls? And what were you doing? He, he I, I scripted all his opt-in videos, uh, all the, the free content videos, and he just wanted to do that and maybe answer a few questions. But he said, he's like, dude, my fingers are about to bleed. You're, I'm up to like past midnight answering questions. and oh. But then when he got his big six-figure check, he's like, you know what? It's okay. I'll do that anytime. <laughs> so what, were the, what was in the videos that worked so well that um, you scripted for him? Uh, just a lot of reason why. Um, a lot of future pacing. I guess what was the product exactly? Um, it was an instructional DVD series. Okay. So on on everything from driving to putting, or was there something specific that, Yep. yeah, you know, how not to shank. Um, that's another point about open, open rates, why it's important and how you can deposit them into your bank account is, uh, shanking. I actually split tested and, you know, cause a lot of the products that they sold, you know, covered a wider range of things just like his product yeah. and so one email um the focus was on shanking and i learned that a lot of people shanking is huge right versus others because you know the, the sales letter is covering a wider range of th- things so you know you can't just cover everything at once so right. you, you try different things at different emails and by split testing i found out that the shanking was a huge key um so that's part of his product cover that as well. What else surprised you with the golf niche? Like you'd think, oh, someone just wants to drive 300 yards, but shanking, you know, people just relate to shanking. What else in the golf niche surprised you that worked? Um, the, 
their capacity for her products. They're like, that's the most rabid niche uh, I've ever seen. I, I would say that it's probably a little more rabid than survival. Um, I love survival. That was really fun. I recently did that last year. Uh, but golf, it was just, they could not get enough. Mm. Um, and, and what's awesome about the golf niche, and I think it's applicable anywhere, is that you don't have to overthink it. I mean, you give them a two-minute or less video that shows them one little thing that they can go out and practice and mm. get a result and just go nuts. Mm -hmm. And more and more, I see these people say, oh, don't give anything free away, and you're just going to train them to be freebie seekers. It's, to me, it's total BS. What they're saying is that I suck at giving free content. It really wasn't working for me, so that therefore, no one, it doesn't work for anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, totally not true. Um, that's another big thing that... Um, I did for the Martin Chuck lunch is with the free events is that I did probably 70, 50 to 70 percent more videos, more live events with the one and, you know, had huge results. Mm -hmm. A lot of free, valuable, action packed contents. You don't have to buy it and uh, it still works. Mm -hmm. So what worked in the first launch with the with the bigger celebrity? Um. You know, obviously, just him as a celebrity, the, the opportunity. Oh, what worked was is that they have Revolution Golf had their regular, um, you know, weekly coaches, you know, like Jim McLean. He's a famous instructor. Um, so some days will be Jim McLean videos or some of his um, coaches under him teaching things. And then some days will be Martin. Some will be psychological uh, you know, the psychological game of golf. Mm -hmm. um, so what I came up with is is that we're not just going to come out and say, oh, yeah, we got this great – Gary Player is going to show you how to do X, Y, and Z in this new DVD series. I was like um, – I f did a pre-pre-launch. I don't know if you heard of that mm -mm, no. where I kind of teased them about you're going to be super excited to hear who's going to be your uh, instructor next week. And so I eliminated everybody else – for the for the launch and um i took valuable free content ripped it out of the actual product and used it for that and so i made him the the uh, revolution golf instructor for that period mm. and um that works amazing people were just going nuts and um did the uh the early bird list that was huge um I did the early bird list uh, underneath the free videos, and then I would follow up and do one-click registration for the early bird uh, emails. It worked really well. And that was another thing that surprised Justin. I think he said in his uh, rave review that it was about, I don't, I don't know if it was 30 or 40K, um, but with the Martin Chuck launch, um, I think he's like, you know, I think it would be you know, out of this world if we got about 20K. So he, again, it wasn't high expectations, and uh, ended up being like sixty thousand wow. on the early bird list. Wow, that's that comes from all his complaints about me breaking their server. <laughs> that's a good good problem to have, though. So I want I have like another golf question, Jason, but I want to ask about the server. You mentioned rabid markets, right? Golf mm -hmm. survival. What other markets have you seen are rabid markets that just buy multiple types of products uh dating mm -hmm. um i worked uh in that niche quite a while back uh for craig clemens he's a pretty famous copywriter yeah, yeah i interviewed craig yeah oh yeah cool yeah he's a cool guy um i i introduced him to sam and they hung out in new york recently yes yes yeah, he talked about double your dating type of mm -hmm. offers and copy and things like that. Right. Um, so, yeah, dating, they're really rabid. You know, you got the poor, desperate nerd at home, does not a, doesn't have any confidence in any aspect of a relationship. So, yeah, they, they eat it up. Mm -hmm. So, what do people buy in survival? how to survive the apocalypse that Obama's bringing, you like know? Like what? Like what are some things that people are, are buying or selling? You know, you got to be able to 
you know, start a fire in three feet uh, deep water and <laughs> when it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to be able to protect yourself from, you know, the uh, uh, cannibals, the raving mad cannibal zombies that are going to be banging on your door trying to break in and eat your family and eat all your food. You must go to town on these emails. So what what sells well in the survival? What have you found sells well in the survival? Fear. Just you know, shit's going to hit the fan. Um, yeah, anything Obama. Uh, one of the things is, you know, paying attention to the market. I couldn't believe I was at a recent mastermind and uh, there was two. There was a, there was a self-defense and then um, that had a lot of gun stuff. And then there was a survival guy. And I looked at all their, my, I was on their list and they were saying nothing about American Sniper. It's like, what the hell are you guys thinking? Come on. It's like the highest uh, grossing war movie of all time. And everybody's talking about it. Yeah. And um, they hadn't used it yet. So one guy eventually did. But yeah, I would be all over American Sniper and uh, how that relates to the coming apocalypse and Mm -hmm. how you're going to have to be able to laser target and protect your family. Yeah. So fear combined with current events is huge right um and golf that's another thing about golf is that you know a lot of people the standard line is you know uh you don't want to be humiliated with your buddies and stuff Mm. um and that's another thing i tested and uh it wasn't uh it wasn't fear for golf it's you know it wasn't the stick it was the carrot it was you know embarrassing your friends not your friends embarrassing is you you're gonna embarrass them and people are gonna be you know raving about you and looking at you um so that was interesting yeah. but survival was totally total fear and your your family's gonna die and what are you gonna do when your wife is killed <laughs> i'm buying i'm buying <laughs> <laughs> you know i was listening to a video the video one of the video testimonials uh, you have many out there actually of justin uh, the CEO of Revolution Golf, and he said, you took apart the template of the daily email, an email that goes out to 30 million or 30 million times per month and redid it, and they saw an incredible increase in engagement by just some small tactics. So my obvious question is, so what, what were these small tactics? What did you do to increase engagement? Um, one, I removed all the... Or I rearranged it so it was more personal. Um, started off with, um, you know, introduction versus a logo. So they had a logo at the top, and I was like, they already know it's from Revolution Golf. You, need to, you don't need to have a Revolution Golf logo there. Put it at the bottom. Um, I changed. They had a colored – they had a white background and then colored borders. Like, you don't need color borders. Take those off. Um, they had weird formatting. It didn't look very good in mobile. Um, and it didn't have a lot of personality. It was just like, you know, hey, here's what I got for today. Hope you enjoy it. See you later. So I used a lot of more stories, a lot more personality. Um, did a lot of interviews. I, you know, kept on flogging Justin to let me know what was going on in his life, where he was, where he was golfing, mm-hmm. you know, what he loved about it. Um, yeah, just a lot more personality, a lot of more personal one-to-one conversational tone, mm. stuff like that. So what were some of your favorite stories that you included in the emails? Uh, probably between his relationship with his, um, the co-founder of Revolution Golf, uh, Dean Strickler. So uh, Justin is a scratch golfer. That means he's a stud golfer. And Dean is more, you know, kind of like, the people on their list trying to get better yeah. and uh, still loves to golf. Um, and so just whenever they golf, I would just tell stories <laughs> about him and Justin and how they'd rag on each other. And he would just be calling out Dean and ragging on him in the uh, emails. And I'd include pictures of wherever Justin was last and pictures of him and Dean hanging out at the golf club and all that stuff. So, did you find any images that you use work well in the golf space? Because I know you like uh, images. Action images worked really well. And I found out during the launches that 
the action images um, worked well until it came time to actually get them to buy that the action images still increased the click-through rate, but it decreased the sales. And my theory was, you know, I was like, why is that? Um, and then I split tested it and I used a, you know, a high perceived value um, photo shot of what they were going to get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that decreased the click throughs, but increased the sales. Really? So my, yeah. So my theory was the reason, you know, why has that happened is because they had been going through this pre-launch and getting all this amazing content. So it doesn't matter what I saw, they saw this action shot and they, Pro maybe they did, maybe they didn't, maybe they didn't really read all the email, but they just saw that shot and like, oh, another free video. So that that there the wrong like a, expectation. Not a, there wasn't a when they got to that page, it it wasn't kind of following what, what they were mindset, expecting. What they're expecting, right? I see. Yeah, that's interesting. So you talked about you know the survival, the fear, right? Golf, you want to humiliate your friend. Right. And um, so what was it for the, the marketing machine, the Main Street marketing? Oh, Main Street marketing machines yeah. uh, is you can do it no matter where you're at. Um, probably one of the best emails I had was the story about um, one of their heroes, you know, one of their students that had made it big and how uh, they couldn't even afford they couldn't afford the hot water bill, so it was turned off, and mm. they had to um, listen to their children scream in pain while they bathed them in cold water. So that is painful. That did, yeah. And but now they're, you know, I forget what it was, but they're just doing amazingly well by using, you know, their existing knowledge, and um, of course, how easy it was. Mm -hmm. uh, which is all relative, you know, as you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, any, so I just featured a lot of case studies of people that were just like you and me or, you know, just like you, whoever was getting the email yeah. uh, and how they were able to make it by uh, using, you know, their existing skills, you know, whether it be SEO or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, how easy it was with all the tools and stuff like that. Um, which I don't know if you want me to tell you, there's, there's a huge learning in there for one of the affiliates that complained about my swipes, but later, uh, yeah, ate go, his ahead. Words. go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go for it. So <clears throat> affiliate comes to me. I had been writing really long swipes. My reasoning was, is because, so this is like, it's not biz up in the general sense, you know, it's not a get rich quick type of thing. And then like an MLM or something like that, or, you know, basically do absolutely nothing and make a gazillion dollars. But it was like, you know, a, a you know, normal business opportunity. And um, so that's pretty, that's not specific as in like, you know, buy this product and build a list of 10,000 people, you know? Right. So right. you're going to get really specific partners for that. So, you know, it's a business opportunity that a lot of different people could do. If you're good at paid traffic, you can do it. If you're good at organic traffic, if you're good at email, if, you know, anything. Um, so I was writing really long affiliate swipes. So I was trying to target a lot of different things. And um, I was telling stories. And this guy was more of a straight-up biz op, you know, kind of a little more scammy. Um, type of deal and he goes dude he's like my list loves short emails all you're giving me is this long crap it's like can you write some short emails and i was like i i knew him before this event so i kind of was frank with him i said dude are you sure your list doesn't like short or long emails or you just suck at writing them right <laughs> It's uh, like, because I no see that a lot. A boring copy, it's, or you know, whatever, long copy, it's just copy that's boring, or whatever the right. saying is. Yeah. And I see that all, uh, side note, I see it all the time is people, uh, quote unquote, email marketing experts giving advice um, just because they suck at something. So obviously everybody sucks at it. No, it's like you suck at it. So, you know, it's a hard get pill better to swallow, at it. though. Yeah. I know. Um, so how do you react to you when you said that? 
So he, he took it in stride and I was like, why don't you just test it? He's like, all right, I'll test it. So he came up with a really short blind email and uh, used my long copy word for word and uh, made five times more sales. So there you go. Um, which just goes to show you, you know, that doesn't mean long emails work best. Right. Uh, really good long emails work really well, and you shouldn't assume that your list likes short emails. So mm -hmm. it's always the important thing there is testing. Yeah. And Jason, you were mentioning stories. What ways do you use to best craft a story and the process? Because you said you know, you'll take in this case study or that case study. What's your process for finding those particular stories that are going to fit? And then how do you craft them in an email? How I craft them is, like I was saying before, just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You know, like how would I talk to someone if I, try, if I was trying to sell them face-to-face? -face. Mm -hmm. And uh, just really listening and paying attention and uh, knowing the product, whether you're an affiliate or if you're writing for the product owner, is you just got to know the market and what's going to really hit home. Like when I heard about they had no inclination of using the that one case study or getting so detailed and how painful it was. And I said, oh, hell yeah, we're using that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you really got to know what's going to uh, hit the heartstrings. And um, so as far as more about detailed, um, you know, it's pretty simple. Like I said, it's you're just starting off with, you know, basically, you know, the simplest way is ADA, attention, interest, desire, and action. Mm -hmm. That's another thing you can say about subject lines is people's problems is that all they try to do is get attention in subject lines. Well, I find and Mech Labs find by testing that attention plus interest works, mm -hmm. you know, in most cases way better than just jumping up and screaming, say, hey, me, 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 me. Um, but yeah, ADA is basically how I structure the story. Get their attention. The you know the sob story coming from nothing, mm -hmm. um, and you know you're telling the story. It's all about people always say you know you don't you know it can't be all about you. It's got to be all about them. But it's not necessarily true if they can relate to it. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be so blatant and specific. Um, I find so. So like the sob story about, you know, having to listen to your children's children scream as you bathe them in cold water um, and then building from that and how they turned it all around um, and what, what exactly they did and how easy it was and how amazing their life is. And if you want to know more about how you can e easily, you know, blah, 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 without doing X, Y, and Z, Right. watch the following free video yeah. before I, it's taken down. Yeah, I have a random thought. I'm just going to throw it out there. But um, what I think is really cool about your email response warrior, and everyone should go check it out, but is your risk reversal at the end is unbelievable. You know, the yep. way you reverse the risk in, in is amazing. So I don't know why that popped into my head, but people have to go to that and read the bottom. It's so conversational. It's like, you know, you're, you say... Um, not that I memorized it, but, um, you know, just go to PayPal and if you need a refund, you know, hell, just forget PayPal. I'll do it myself and do it manually. You know, you go through this whole conversation, which is really interesting. Right. Anyways, random thought. Um, One of my mentors for risk reversal and offers and guarantees is um, Million Dollar Mike Morgan. Mm -hmm. His stuff is good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, your favorite subject lines. Yeah, um, so I like confrontational with uh, your readers. So I did a – we haven't talked about Next Internet Millionaire, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's some good stuff there. But um, before I did that, I had done a project with Million Dollar Mike Morgan. You know, he's one of Agora's top copywriters. And back then he was just uh, freelancing for a lot of different uh, internet marketers. And we did a project, and um, he wanted me to write the emails. And 
that's kind of how um, I kind of got the idea that I was on to something because he kind of got perturbed with me because I kept on asking. I was like, so is this email okay? Is this email okay? He's like, dude, stop showing me these emails. They're smoking hot. Just send the damn email. Mm-hmm. And um, so I th- figured, you know, if he thought they were good, you know, maybe I was doing th- doing it all right. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, it's like, so one of the emails I sent was um, – you know, your headlines suck. And uh, then I said, like, you know, but don't don't worry. My headlines used to suck, too. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, here's how you can, you know, fix it. So that was one of my favorite ones. I got a lot of responses that were they, they were jokingly confrontational back. They're like, hey, what the hell do you mean? I'm like, well, I guess they could be better. And so nothing too crazy, but I got a lot of response from that. And then for Revolution Golf... The one I was talking about where I got 166,000 um, opens and over 77,000 clicks and made over, you know, five figures in revenue was uh, reach par fives in two. Hmm. Um, and the reason why I did that was because it was for promotion that had been promoted a lot before. So I was thinking of a new angle. I was like, hmm, what am I going to do this? Morning? So I looked through the sales letter and there was this one bullet. And it says, you know, reach par fives and two. And like I said, my wife's the golfer. She wasn't around. So I searched online and I was like, man, it's kind of hard to reach par fives and two, even for the pros. Mm. And uh, so it just stuck I asked, out to you. yeah, so I asked my wife, I was like, can the average golfer, you know, even if they're really avid golfers, you know, always on the weekends playing golf, is it believable that they could reach par fives and two? And she's like, Hell no. <laughs> there's no, there's no way. And uh, she's like, she's like, I wouldn't use it. It's not believable. And I said, awesome. I'm going to use it because you know that's standard thinking. It's not believable. You know, don't use it. So I was, wanted to test it, and uh, it worked. It worked like gangbusters. And um, the email was super short, which that's why I s- said that that uh, case study from the big Koenig's launch. Testing was the key, not long versus short. Um, and what I did with the short email was I made, like Carlton says, make every word tell or make every word count. And uh, it was basically a ripoff of Gary Halbert. It was an if-then statement. You know, if you want to discover how to reach, reach par fives in two uh, without changing your current swing, you know, Click here to find out now. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think the call to action, which we could talk about because I've tested calls to action a lot, is is, is to reach par fives in two. Wait, say again that it skipped out for just a second. What was was the last thing? Oh, uh, Uh, click here to to reach par fives in two. Uh, dot, dot, dot. And the reason why I use that, and my wife is really good, she's my copy editor, she gets me to like cut out a lot of things, is she may have done it this, you know, rather than saying click here to discover or click here um, to maybe or anything like that. It was just click here to reach par fives in two. Mm-hmm. Nice, short, and sweet. And, uh, yeah, worked at Gangbusters. That headline is short and sweet, you know. Yeah. Reach par fives in two, uh, dot, dot, dot. So shocking bullets uh, are good. What are some other memorable headlines that you've uh, liked subject lines yeah subject lines yeah um oh so if god if god was an affiliate he'd promote this (laughs) how'd you come up with that i have no idea um somebody on a popular facebook group for product owners that want are always looking for stuff to promote he sent it to his list of affiliates to get them to promote because i think i did a free q a session for him so he was just no second tier he just wanted to tell his affiliates to promote my product mm. and he's like can you write a swipe for me he's like hmm so it's going to a bunch of affiliates they're they're getting pitches all the time like hey you should promote this product so what can i do and so i just hmm i, I don't know what i was thinking but I don't know if it's a TV show, which I watch a lot, but I uh, just came up with that, and then people started raving about it and uh, praising the guy 
uh, that sent it out. He's like, sorry, man, I didn't do that. It was Big Jason. Mm. So do you have a method for subject line? I mean, do you read through a copy? Do you do an interviews? Do you look at forums? What's your method when you want to send? At this point, it becomes more intuitive. So, you know, when I ask that question, like, I don't know what I did, but something's going on. What did you do in the beginning before you kind of just, it would just come out? What did you do to, to get a, to a good subject line that you thought was good? Well, I thought about who is it going to and what they're, what they're used to. So they're getting pitches all the time. Hey, this is the greatest thing in the world. You'll make a lot of money. And so I basically wanted to stand out and, uh, you know, set myself apart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's unique about this? Well, mm -hmm. if God was a filler, like he'd promote this. You know, no one else is saying that. Um, uh, so that was just the thinking about that because it, that's very specific. You know, I might not use that uh, to my list, but for a, a list of affiliates who are looking yeah. for stuff to promote, you know, that stands out from the crowd. Yeah. So, you know, Jason, a lot of the campaigns have done really well. What about one that didn't do well and why? So I was, you know, I don't know if you're to Ryan Levesque. He's got this yeah. really good. Yeah, he's got Ryan this Levesque, really yeah, good. Awesome. Yeah, he's got this really good coaching program. So I was like, hey, man, you know, I, I like how you've been selling this. And, uh, you know, I, I worked with him as well. And I said, do you mind if I model you? And he's like, no, go ahead, sure. Uh, let me know how it goes. And so I came up with a storyline. Um, it was dial a marketing hero monthly. So I wanted to do monthly, private monthly coaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had this series of emails and my dad was a secret government agent and uh, there was alternate universes <laughs> uh, secret labs and uh, superpowers and uh, I used the TV show Heroes Have you, you know that and um, probably one of the one that got open and clicked the most was you know I am Siler and I had this image of me superimposed with Siler and uh, I was talking about how uh, I'm like Siler, I don't have to rip people's head up with my finger, you know, because I was talking about how I get in the minds of customers. Right. So I am like Siler, but I don't have to go <laughs> right. tear their head open. Um, and like even uh, Scott Haynes, he just uh, emailed me out of the blue. He's like, dude, how'd that promo go? Dude, was, your emails are, it's been amazing. It probably did really well. Uh, and it bombed. Uh, he made a couple sales. And uh, I talked to him. I talked to Sammy Markowitz, my other buddy. Um, and we came to the conclusion that it was, really wasn't the emails. The emails were really good and got a lot of response. It was the uh, sales letter. The sales letter was really confusing. Um, like the, one of the people that did take me up on it, they were a raving fan, which is another good point that you should listen more to your non-raving fans versus your raving fans mm -hmm. because they're highly motivated and – like I had a confusing, crappy sales because letter. Because it was like, you, they'll right, buy whatever you are because they know you put out high quality stuff, so they'll just purchase right. it type of thing. And um, versus, and I think a lot of information out there is targeted for people's raving fans, which is not the way to go. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it was the, it was the sales letter that uh, was, what was confusing about it. It really didn't go. It was for private monthly coaching on a one-to-one -one basis um and i had already promoted a group coaching that did well and so i didn't really change a lot of stuff um really wasn't a lot of reason why it was just like eh, I, they know me they love me they'll buy it and uh it totally bombed which is another good reason why when someone says oh yeah you should check out the email it's the best email i've ever seen and there's no sales attached to it. Um, you know, you got to be careful on what you're modeling because you don't know how well it actually mm, did. Right. Um, I mean, that that's what, and I tell people this is like, that's actually one of the biggest sign that copy sucks is when someone's saying it's the best email or the best copy they they've ever it. seen. Yeah. 
Um, I've even chastised my own students. They've actually replied to emails like, dude, how did you do that? It was so cool. And then I'll look and I'll reply and I was like, well, I don't know why you want to know or why you think it's so cool. I just looked and you didn't buy. So there's, you know, I don't know why you want to copy it. It's a good response. Actually- and they're just like, just like, well, uh, I was like, dude, no. I was like, if you notice the strategy or technique, then, you know, it's not the best email. My, my best response is when people curse at me. <laughs> like what? What's, what's uh, one where people curse at you? Um, coach, he actually said I could say his name. His name's Darren Monroe. Really cool guy. I've met him, yeah. And uh, he's actually been pissed off at me several times because he's <laughs> – he decides He's I don't the want. He's nicest guy. I don't see him being pissed off at anyone. <laughs> well, pissed off in a good way. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, you, you got people that are like they tell their wife they're not going to buy anything else, or they promise themselves, okay, you know, I need to take more action. I don't need to buy anything else, yeah. and they're just like, oh. And then you write something so good. Um, let me see here. I can't find it, but he was basically, uh, he said, he started off with, you know, damn it, I wasn't going to buy anything else. And I didn't even have the link. It was just a tease. And he's like, damn it, send me the link. I want to buy it. <laughs> what was it? Do you remember? Uh, it was affiliate promo for uh, Bond and Kevin Halbert's um, uh, ad breakdown of one of their father's ads. Mm, mm. Yeah. Which is another good point because um, speaking of Gary Halbert, uh, I was talking to Bond once, and um, he has this. His dad has this really famous ad, and they used a celebrity, and there's an image of the celebrity um, in the ad. It was really prominent, and I said, Bond, you know your dad better than anyone. You know you were he was taking you out of school to go to mastermind meetings and all that good stuff. Um, as good a copywriter as Gary was, do you think the ad would have done as well without the image? And he immediately said no nope, uh, because of the credibility and the trust factor using that image. So that just uh, speaks another, um, another point to how powerful images can be mm-hmm. if you use them the right way in images. And, uh, you know, yeah, you can add proof, credibility, um, and instill belief, just using the written word. But the question is, how much better can you do it uh, by testing using images? Yeah. So what, Jason, shocks people in your email response warrior program? Uh, depending on who it is, you would not believe how many multi-million dollar companies actually cannot tell you how much a email made. Hmm. The worst advice I've ever heard is track revenue by date range, like how much you're making per month. That's ridiculous. You don't know which emails are working and which ones are not. Um, so I've actually delayed um, actually optimizing emails for a client by a month because it's like, you know this market better than, I, better than me. You know, who the hell am I? Um, you know, I don't know which emails are, I could be destroying some of your emails that are really good. And so it took them a month to get the tracking just because they had a complicated setup. They had like tons of products. Uh, most people that don't just have a few products, it's not that big a deal to set up the tracking. You can use Google Analytics, but uh, it's super important to know how much email makes or doesn't make. And uh, an extra tip that I just actually um, brought to the attention of a client, a copywriter, um, and that's another point is I, you know, John Carlton and Craig Clemens, um, Tony Flores, I uh, worked with a lot of top copywriters and written emails for them. And people are like, you know, why the have you write? I mean, th- can't they write the emails? I'm like, yeah, like I'm no better than them. They could write emails, but these guys like Carlton, they understand that email marketing is not about just copy. You know, it really is about the right message to the right person at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what was I saying? I you're got talking lost. talking about tools. You're talking about the tools and tracking. Oh, yes. The, a recent client that just bought a few hours of consulting time, they wanted me to figure out, you know, why their response was down so low. He's a really good copywriter. 
And um, one of the things he was doing, he was using images and he was using several links. And if you ever hear someone say that you need to use X amount of links, don't listen to them. It's ridiculous. It's just so stupid to just be robotically like, okay, I got to put three links in the email. No, you don't. We all have heard those things, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so they were tracking, which was good. They did a lot of affiliate offers, so they're using the ClickBank TID and SubID tracking for others. But they were only using one for every single link in the email. Mm. So they knew how much it was making, but they had no idea about if it was the image or if it was this link I or see. that link. Yeah. And I've tested it. And I track all that, so I know that in not in all cases, but in some cases, you could if you put a link higher up in the wrong place, it could get a ton of clicks, and you might be like, "Oh yeah, yay!" But then if you actually know how much money it makes, you'll find that those are not good clicks yeah. in, in some cases, and uh, I guarantee they're going to find that because I find it in practically every every time I do it. Um, me typically. Um, I'll do one link per email, and I won't even link images that are just part of telling the story. Because why would you want to eject someone at mid-story? They haven't even really got to the you know the finale, mm -hmm. and they just you know psychologically they see that the image is linked, and they just want to click it. <laughs> right. So that's another point: is that um, you know images could be for storytelling. Um, credibility but you don't have to link them every single time yeah yeah it goes back to your point too with the the golf images even though the images of the actual cd or you know the right. discs actually Packages. had a lower click through but those people bought yeah yeah um so what other tools do you like to use that you recommend uh you know apart from google analytics um i use clicky and the difference is, is that Clicky is real time. So especially for Revolution Golf, their huge list and split testing, I could see which version was winning, you know, almost immediately sometimes. Mm -hmm. Depending on the time of send, you know, had you know tens of thousands of clicks and I could see who which email was producing the most sales or, or whatever I was testing at the time. Um, so I really like Clicky, clicky.com. Um other than that, for email, that that's basically all you need. Um, for email service providers, I like Active Campaign. Active Campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're a little harsh on affiliate marketers, but if you're a product owner that once in a while promotes affiliate offers and it's more of a value base where you're you're sharing something, and then by the way, um, they don't really have a problem with that. But yeah, it's it's a thousand times better than AWeber, get response, eye contact. And a lot of people don't realize that with AWeber um, and others, if you use single opt-in, they actually penalize you. They bend you over and they put you on IPs that are not as clean as hmm. the IPs they put double opt-in on. Really? Yeah, and I'm about to interview Dennis Damon, a good buddy of mine from Return Path this week. And uh, he'll tell you that it's total BS that by default, double opt-in gets better deliverability. It's not true. Um, so that's another point where single versus double opt-in. It's it's how you treat your list. So just because someone does does double opt-in doesn't mean they're going to have good practices and not send unrelated offers. Um, and so my point is, Active Campaign doesn't do that. If you're single opt-in, they don't penalize you. Mm. And they have they have the marketing features of Infusionsoft and Entrepreneur Entreport. But without the price tag, it's really the, it's kind of like the pricing of AWeber or GetResponse, but way more marketing features um, than all the all the rest. Interesting. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, sure. you know, Jason, with the email response warrior, what's one of your favorite components that you included in there? Um, the ultimate guide to using images and emails is one. And then I also, as a bonus, include the email copywriting boot camp. And there's two, two interviews I did with Mech Labs. That you can't just call them up and say, hey, do a webinar for me. So they, just because I've been going there so long, they did me a favor. Right. And um, one was Austin McCraw, and it was on value proposition. And the, he went through a case study where 
like I was saying, you know, the golf, you know, is it the unbelievable deal in price or is it actually what they're going to get mm. or what it's going to do for them? Same thing. I did a case study. Um, so you basically you can test value propositions by using email mm. and, um, and then apply it. Like they have one case study where it was overall through the entire funnel was like a 668% increase in revenue wow. just by testing it in one place and then applying it. So you're, you're testing assumptions. You know, you're testing your intu intuition, but and a lot of times your intu intuition is crap. Uh, <laughs> right. you know, it's not what you even expect. For, and that's that's something to be said. Even for experts like you, you still have to test. Yep. So if you have to test, then the rest of us better right. believe we need to test. Yep. And then the other one was with um, Adam Lapp. He's like one of their directors of optimization, and um, we did some critiques. We critiqued Vaughn and Kevin and some other emails and landing pages. And we also uh, we went through the Obama campaign because hmm. people were going nuts over that. So we analyzed the, we actually went below the radar of what most people see. And we actually um, shared some really killer information on what you can learn from that. Yeah. I mean, I was tempted, Jason, just to go through, like have those be all my questions and just ask, so what was the simple strategy that will skyrocket your open rate? You know, <laughs> so many good, but one did stick out to me that I wanted to ask about is the curiosity. You, one of the bullets was curiosity is the number one emotion to use in your subject line, right? Wrong. Wrong. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like the attention versus attention plus interest. Gotcha. So you look at, you look at your competitors and everybody's just, an attention whore, like, hey, look at me, look at me. Mm -hmm. My name's Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Kim, Kim K. And uh, so, yeah, just curiosity plus specificity, you know. Yeah. Three, three ways to, you know, increase your open rate by 250% overnight. Um, so it's, <clears throat> you know, people got the hay and the the hay and oh my god or bad news and usually it's coming from a huge authority like i said a lot of cases those guys can say you know they buy say this whatever shit. they want yeah right um so just from testing you know more opens more revenue mm -hmm. uh from adding the actual reason why they should open up your email so it's kind of like the value proposition. You got your overall value proposition, but then you got these sub value propositions. So that's kind of like my formula for looking at um, subject lines is out of all these emails in my inbox, you know, not everybody like has 781,483 emails in their inbox like me, but you know, most people have a lot of emails. Right. So if I'm your subscriber, out of all these emails, why should I open up this email versus anything else? You know, I got kids. Kevin Hubbard likes to say, you know, imagine they have to pee really bad. You know, what's going to get them to open up the email? Right. What's the single reason? So that's kind of what I think about. Yeah. So when you go in, you obviously have a lot of high-end clients and companies. What's what are the biggest mistakes you see them making? Even the sophisticated people. Right. Not tracking not knowing what really works best. That's my specialty is finding out what, working, what works best. Um, uh, frequency, you know, you got one camp that says, you know, everyone should mail daily, everyone. And then you got the one that says, you should never mail daily, it's too much. Well, both are wrong, mm -hmm. you know, it depends. Um, but the one thing that through my 18 plus years of experience is that, um, 99.9% .9 of people should email more frequently. It's not the frequency. Most of the cases where you see people that have done really well, better by emailing daily, it's because they weren't emailing enough. So it really, that's really not scientific. Yeah. You know, uh, in my experience, it's not that they're emailing daily; it's that they're emailing more frequently. Mm. Um, so they're not emailing frequently enough. Like Revolution Golf actually asked me, is like, do you think we're mailing too much? Should we scale down? Should we only go? I was like, no, mail more. <laughs> were they doing multiple times a day, did you say? Uh, yeah. Uh, they did a content email and a sales email. Hmm. 
And uh, I was like, hell no, don't mail less. Because um, like I said, that's was awesome about golf is they're just rabid. Mm. Um, but not every, not every niche is, so it kind of depends. But the, most people in, in practically every case sh- should be mailing more frequently. So that's, that's what I see a lot. Um, and then again, they believe they believe a lot of BS stuff, you know, about the images. Um, th- that just blows my mind. No, don't use images because you want your emails to be more personal. Huh? You mean a picture of me and my wife is not personal? Me and my bunny? Um, me at the golf? That, that makes no sense to me. How is that not more personal? It's just an assumption on their part. Right. And um, Or the, my favorite one is you should email like a newspaper. These short, tiny columns that look like crap on mobile yeah, phones. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just, I've talked about this in several of my podcasts, and I go, the last time I looked at a newspaper, it's not a single column. Right. <laughs> it's multiple columns, and not this, not this article, but most of them all have images. Right. So that's. That's common to people that say you should email in a narrow column is don't use images, but newspapers have multiple columns and use images, so it makes no sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. I love that you get passionate about this, so keep going. <laughs> yes. I'm about to um, – the 23rd through the 26th is this year's the 10th annual uh, email summit by marketing shipper Mick Labs, and I'm pumped. I'm going to be taking the email messaging optimization workshop again and um, the online testing certification again. And uh, I actually took three – no, I actually took um, someone from Mind Valley to the email summit, and then I took three people from Mind Valley to the optimization summit. When I was at the email summit, uh, Dr. Flint came up in front of the Mind Valley person and said – and goes to her, she's like, I don't know why Jason keeps coming. He's been here every single year. Um, He could probably teach this. He's like, in fact, Jason, I'm really tired. I'm going to go take a nap. Can you teach the next session? Uh, Like I said, you know, I'm really passionate about this, and I always want uh, to learn new things and uh, test new things. Yeah. So, Jason, since this is Inspired Insider, tell me about your lowest moment and then how you push forward through it. Lowest moment. Um, so in 2009, when I did that uh, big product launch, it was actually a relaunch of one of the biggest product launches in internet history at that time. I think they did like $8 million. And um, it was a very polarizing product. It was CPA marketing, and there was huge claims. Uh, it was very biz And I spent 75% of my time actually rebuilding relationships because – not only did they not mail the 60K list for a year, but after the launch, they didn't mail the affiliates. No thank yous, no reciprocal mailings, nothing. Mm. Just dead silent. And um, the new product, uh, the opt-in pages were, had uh, cocaine and prostitutes. <laughs> really? It was, yeah. <laughs> it was way out there. Uh, it, it was, you know, it had a hook, but it was very controversial. And then the new, there was, it was going to be a new product, um, but it was kind of intangible. It was kind of hard to pin down what it actually was. And we ended up losing money. Hmm. So it was probably the first launch in internet marketing history where it was a successful launch, relaunched it, and you, we lost money. And I got kind of the blame for the affiliates not promoting and uh i was kind of pissed off i was like dude i did my best you know i got them to open up all the emails they're clicking i was at this conference and someone said you know hey you're doing really good things um with the the emails for this launch and i said yeah i was like did you see the one with the bunny rabbit and he's like no but i heard about it um so i was people were taking notice and everything but it just didn't do well and so I kind of got blamed. So I was kind of pissed off that I was taking the blame for this. And I assumed that people outside the launch would take notice of it. So I'm like, oh, I'm screwed. I was going to go back to into my own little thing and try to make that work and not, 
I'm not going to have a lot of clients because they think I suck now. And that exact opposite happened. People started emailing me out of the woodwork saying, hey, Jason, I love what you did with that launch. He's like, can you do it for me? And then John Carlton's business partner was contacting me, wanted me to work for them. And Stompernet wanted me to work for them. And uh, so it, I was at a really low point. But then I kind of realized that, you know, hey, if you do your best, you put yourself in the best possible position to succeed, then, you know, it's going to be okay no, no matter what people do. Um, and similar to that, I worked for a pretty big name in internet marketing, and it went terrible. And what he communicated, I did not – I obviously didn't understand, and he was pissed off, and I would already done a lot of work, and there was hard feelings. Um, and then he started telling people. Mm. So that was – That's really uh, hard. Yeah, it was really hard. But then – you know, as you were mentioning, I have a lot of testimonials, and uh, I had worked with Mike Dillard and Robert Hirsch, did their launch, and uh, Mind Valley actually heard the horrible thing from the guy that was bad mouthing me, and they actually contacted uh, Mike Dillard and Robert Hirsch, and they actually told them the exact opposite. Mm. So that's why they decided to work with me. Wow. Uh, is because they are times more successful than the guy bad mouthing me, uh, but they told him the exact opposite. Yeah, so how do you, you know, because that happens online, and how do you internalize that? Because that's one of the toughest things, your reputation. Right. So how do you, what do you do when that's happening? Uh, you know, you just focus on what you can control, and you do your best. And, uh, you know, you, you don't sweat the small stuff. You just push forward and, um, you know, just concentrate on, uh, you know, the good things. Mm. Yeah, that is, that is tough. So on the flip side, Jason, what's one of the proudest moments? Proudest moments. Um... Hmm. I should put this in my notes. Sorry to make you edit this. No, I'm not. I don't do any editing. I'm like uh, that golfer who's the. Oh Martin. yeah, the golf. Yeah, yeah, the golf I'm, I'm like Martin. We just whatever. Oops. Yeah, someone's. I've had uh, you know cat jumping on the keyboard, people walking in, trains. It's fine. All right. Um, it's probably a toss up with the, the Martin Chuck launch and how it, it crushed the, um, the Gary player launch because it had such low expectations. Uh, even Martin had low expectations and, uh, you know, I got, to, on the next launch, I got to meet him in person and speak to him live and just, you know, what he was telling me. And then you see in the testimonies from that he's given me. Um, so that made me feel feel really good that I was able to do that in a in a niche that I I hated actually. Why I grew to love it because I just thought golf was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I never golfed. Um, I had ridden a golf cart. Golf carts are cool. I actually got in trouble when I was in college. The first school I went to was Sacramento State University, and um, they asked us to help out in the administration of a celebrity golf tournament for the Sacramento Kings and um, me and a couple guys on the team got in trouble because we were racing the golf carts <laughs> which I still remember I had a blast uh, but I didn't like watching it I had no inclination to try it and um, yeah just through my research and the skills that I um, existing skills that I had uh, I was able to do really well and especially uh, beat the launch with the number, you know, top five player in the world. Hmm. I actually still have not taken any lessons. I wanted to, um, but I haven't done that. But I actually enjoy watching it now. So your wife can beat you? She showed me a few things, and she just like, I'm so glad you're a writer, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, what about people you've been able to work with because of what you do? Who's some of your favorite people? Uh, 
Mike Dillard. I have never been treated um, so well. Not that anybody treated me bad, but just he he and his team went, you know, out of their way to make sure, you know, I spent like a month in Austin running the launch. And uh, they just took care of me, first class treatment all the way, um, and really took care of me. And uh, he he's just got a really great heart. And um, I love what he does, and he's got a great family. Um, so that's one of my favorites. And then um, the Wildflower Farm. What's that? In, in Elkins, Arkansas. <laughs> uh, yeah, one of my first clients ever when I was playing basketball was for a wildflower farm. And um, they had a bunny rabbit, so that helped. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just had it was it was amazing. Just this, you know, cute couple, older couple, and they had this huge um, acreage of land, and they just sold wildflowers online. So I That's did their random. email and their shopping cart. Yeah, and uh, they're just people. What about Mine Valley? We didn't you didn't talk much about Mine Valley in the respect of. What were the kind of things you do with Mind Valley? Um, you know, they have a lot of product funnels, so they, they they gave me one to work on. So that was probably one of my favorite ones, just because of all the people there. They have, they have this, you know, melting pot of you know young young men and women from all over the world, and um, yeah, especially Omar Michael, the copywriter. Uh, they just had a lot, a lot of really cool people. Real, super smart. Um, so it, it was really easy to work with them to utilize their talents and not have to teach them, you know, every step of the way. Mm-hmm. So, and they they actually saw the value of going to the Mech Lab summits, which people ask. Like clients have actually asked me, like, "Why are you telling me to go to the summit? I have you." It's like because I know that if a client learns this stuff and changes their mindset, it's going to be a hundred times easier to work with them and mm. get things done. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, you were talking about your mentors, you talked about Gary Halbert, Dr. Flint, and what were some of your favorite Dr. Flint sayings? Um, clarity trumps persuasion. Um, that really resonated with me. You know, you should focus on being clear versus persuasive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen that a lot, and I, I see that a lot. Um, one example is in an email copy critique. So there's one way to do it, and I see this a lot, is they present the email and they go, well, it's pretty good. I maybe would have told a story or used a, a simile or a metaphor, and um, they, yeah, I would have closed it a little stronger, and okay, I'm done. And they move on. It's like, what? I said, that's a copy critique. That's not an email copy critique. Um, so I definitely like to focus on being clear versus persuasive. Because mm-hmm. um, emails, it's not just about the copy. Like I was telling before, that's why some of these A-plus copywriters have hired me to write copy email copy for them. Because it's more about that. And one of the examples that Dr. Flint always gives is they actually hired an A-plus copywriter to split test an email to one of their lists. And he shows the email. And there's a this really good metaphor about uh, a, a race car versus a Pinto or something like that. And it's about landing pages. And it's really well written, you know, well written. And uh, then there's the other one that's very plain straight to the point here's here's why you should go and this is what it's going to do for you and people vote and they the majority always say the really flowery and pretty painting pr- mental pictures and metaphors and Flano says nope that one got crushed hmm. like obliterated so that's just one example and I, I think that's where a lot of people get sidestepped like i said when i started all i got was have a personal one-on-one conversation. So it's a lot simpler than people think. 
uh, than becoming an A plus copywriter to write a good email. You just don't want you want to have a conversation. So I really like that uh, quote: "Clarity trumps persuasion." And then um, testing. Let me see the exact quote here. Do you have the quote? Marketing is testing. So do not speculate, test. Nevertheless, it's better to speculate than to conduct an invalid test. Is that the one? Yep. Definitely. Um, You know, people go by a lot of assumptions, um, especially when it comes to email. Like I said, depending on the size of your list, how targeted your list building is, um, you know, you can do a lot of things that quote unquote work, but uh, is it going to make you the most amount of money? Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a lot of speculation. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I see a lot is like I even chastise my students. They're like, oh, yeah, I tried the thing you did and, uh, you know, it kicked ass. It's done better than ever before. I was like, did you test it? They're like, no. And I was like, next thing I asked is like, <laughs> was it a new offer? And they're like, yeah. I was like, Dude, then you don't know that it was so awesome. It could have been the offer. Um, so mm. a lot of people are led astray on things. So that's why testing, especially with the emails, is so important. So you know actually what works and work, what works the best. Yeah, I like that you don't let them get away with that. Yeah. Um, so I have one last question, Jason. This has been phenomenal, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, but before I ask it, tell people more about what you're working on now, what's exciting to you lately. Um, like I said, I'm working with this copywriter, copywriter right now, trying to figure out why their response has gone down so much lately. Um, so I, I charge a thousand bucks an hour. Um, a lot of times the referrals from John Carlton. Um, so I do that from time to time. And then I've, you know, I'm doing the high-level clients. It doesn't have to be a two million size list with Revolution, but someone that's, you know, the guys that are really successful. I just did a, a more corporate client. It was one of the sites that do discounted uh, first class and business class airline tickets, mm. which was really cool. I, I got to use my value proposition training from Mech Labs a lot on that because they're like really every single competitor is basically saying the same thing and the same way. Yeah. So that that's a so tough that was one. Exciting. Actually, that's a really tough one because you can go on all these rate comparison sites and people mm-hmm. are very savvy when it comes to that. Yeah. So right. what, how do you approach that? Again, um, with the value proposition training is just doing my research and seeing how all the different operate and, uh, you know, figuring out a way how to set, set apart. Um, the big thing was finding out the most common complaint. So hmm. I did an interview with the CEO and I did the interview with the top five sales reps and then I went to all the review sites. Wow. And so then I, I was checking out what was the, the biggest complaints and the biggest praise. Yeah. And then um, just looking at how each of the top competitors were doing things and how I could set you know this company apart from them. Yeah. That, so that three minutes should be a bonus on your email <laughs> response warrior. How to cut through the most competitive industry you know, how, what to do in the most competitive industry or something like that with value proposition. Right. That was golden right there. So thank you. Um, sure. So what else? Yeah. So you're saying. Yeah. Um, so um, I actually just worked with a paid traffic agency that does conversion optimization. You know, they split test landing pages, but they want they were doing a, um, a paid Facebook traffic webinar funnel to get new clients. And they wanted, you know, a different set of eyes to look at it to figure out what was going on. Yeah. And uh, so the headline was um, having to do with PPC management company. But the ad, Facebook ads were talking about Google AdWords mm-hmm. um, and how much money you were throwing away. So I was basically, well, you got to disconnect. And at first you're saying you know, how much money you're throwing away. And then it's Google AdWords. But then when they get to the landing page, it's all about the management company. It's like, are you sure that all these people have a management company managing their ads, and then why are you talking about PPC? This is spe- you want to be specific to Facebook, and so like, okay, what do you suggest? So I changed it. <laughs> you ripped it apart, essentially. Right. So I said, get rid of PPC. Never say PPC again. I said, if you want to do another funnel for general paid traffic, okay, but this, this is you're advertising Google AdWords management, so 
only say Google AdWords or AdWords, no more PPC. And uh, I, so I gave them um, how much money are you throwing away with Google AdWords every single month. I can't remember exactly, but it's something like that. Mm -hmm. It was uh, fear-based. And then I said, let's split test it with um, how, to, how to easily increase the ROI uh, of your Google AdWords account without changing a single thing, dot, dot, dot. Hmm. And first they tested the fear and it increased um, the opt-in rate by 48%. Wow. And um, then they split tested the carrot and stick, you know, how much money you're throwing away versus, you know, easily increase your ROI and how much money are you throwing away beat um, increase your ROI by 28%. Wow. That's amazing. So we stuck with it. Right. And then soon, that's another point is that what they really hired me for was email optimization because they weren't getting a good attendance rate. But I explained to them, I was like, well, you know, I'm going to have to look at your face. I want to know where these people are coming from. I want to know what they're seeing on the landing page before they opt in. Yeah. Um, so you got to take a holistic approach yeah. to these things. That's I get drives me nuts when people like, okay, I, I need um, a 12 part email series written and, uh, <laughs> Write, right. write them. I'm like, what? Like, well, you, it's here's the product. Just write the emails. I was like, no, it's not how it works. You know, I got to interview you. I got access to the product. I got to see where they came from. I want to see your paid traffic ads and your option pages and all that good stuff. Um, so then it was about the email series, and um, so I added a countdown timer. Um, I. I reiterated the new finding that uh, it wasn't about having a Google AdWords management company. Um, it was about how much money they were throwing away. Mm -hmm. And um, added a lot more scarcity and urgency, and uh, it increased attendance rate by 50%. Wow. Yeah. So, so and, the, and the another thing about who they were targeting they actually had, I watched, um, as part of my research, I actually watched, they do the webinar live each week, so I watched it live. And at the end, there's an exit survey. And one of the questions is, where are you at with Google AdWords? And it's like, I'm a beginner, someone's managing me. And I was like, why have I not heard about this before? I said, <laughs> give me the last two months responses. And 70% said I'm new to AdWords. Wow. So that's... Goes to show you what uh, assumptions well, can it's cost good they you. They were doing the survey. Yeah. Yeah. So where should we point people towards? Where should they should they check out online to find out more? Um, you can go to emailresponsewarrior.com. Yeah. So and when I say another one, you have too. There's a you have a a uh, don't you have a my magic offer course? Yes, uh, I'm partnered with Mike Morgan. Um, two courses on uh, just increasing your offer. Um, that's his key for his big wins is when he consults with someone rather than, you know, rewriting the entire sales letter. It's a lot of times it's just the offer. So he's got my magic offer and then he's got conversion crash course, which is just about increasing conversions across the entire funnel. Um, and that's my magic offer.com forward slash bundle. So you can get both of those. Mm -hmm. So email response warrior.com and my magic offer.com backslash bundle. Yep. Okay. So my last question, Jason, is I want to hear about the next Internet Millionaire. <laughs> oh, we should. Yeah, we should talk about the next Internet Millionaire and our first contact. And yeah. How I ignored you. <laughs> Apparently, I wasn't good at writing emails because I couldn't get you to respond. <laughs> you, got to me to res you got me to respond on LinkedIn, though. Um, Several months later. Yeah. It's persistent. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I think I had met Joel a couple of times at events, probably a big seminar. This was back then, when? What, what year are we talking that you were, you were on this? 2007? Yeah, 2007. Yeah. Yeah, way back when. And, um, yeah, so the first internet-based reality show. And um, so you had to submit – a video and then people would vote mm -hmm. so i had an email list and I had a pretty big following so 
I finished second in voting during the audition process to Charles Trippy. He's like a YouTube celebrity. He's okay. an internet marketer. He hates internet marketing. Um, so I, I went on, and my strategy from the get-go, when they had the initial meeting, once we got there, we're on a group, and I think Joel and the producer, Eric um, Homeland, or Homeland, Eric Homeland, Joel's buddy, uh, they're like explaining how things are going to go. And I think they were saying something like, you know, we're, we're not going to try to portray you in a bad light and just be yourself. <laughs> I said, hold on a second. I said, uh, do whatever you want with me. You can like totally misrepresent misrepresent me cut me cut it any way you make me look however you want i'll i'll be the male amorosa from the apprentice <laughs> why did and you they say would, that because i know how successful amorosa came after the apprentice and how much attention she got and how how she stood out mm -hmm. and um so i didn't want to be the little you know the nobody that's like meh I wanted everybody to notice me, good or bad, mm -hmm. and uh, and it worked out. A lot of people uh, saw that and were were impressed. And the, that goes to email too, because even though I said I wanted to be the controversial guy and piss people off and be portrayed a certain way, there was nothing staged. It was 100% real. I just spoke my mind. Mm -hmm. Like I was having arguments with Marlon Sanders and Armin Morin and Joel, and yeah, with what the were other you contestants. With them about? Just about the strategies, and you know, I I don't agree. I was like, you're just assuming that, and um, you know, I was just spoke my mind. I wasn't afraid. A lot of people were afraid to speak their mind, and I wasn't. And um, yeah, so. As far as email, I see that a lot. There's, people actually teach people that you should be an a-hole on your list once in a while just to get a rise out of people. And they say, like, oh, if they unsubscribe, you don't want to be working with them anyways. Like, why would you say that? Maybe they don't want to work with you because you're an a-hole. Maybe they are a targeted prospect or a happy customer, and they just think you're an a-hole. Right. Maybe that's the problem is you're an a-hole. So I never encourage people to be uh, – intentionally yeah. polarizing or being a jerk to get attention is like be yourself if you if you're on a list that's you know got a mix of the left and the right you know democrat republican and you loved american sniper you can talk about it. talk about how it applies to marketing and stuff mm -hmm. um just be yourself just let it all lay out but don't intentionally be a jackass yeah. what was the low and high of being on the internet millionaire um, the high is all the attention I got um, from really top high-level marketers. I was getting pinged a lot. You know, Mike Morgan loved it. Mark Joyner was really impressed, and uh, a lot of others. They they saw through all the cutting and how they're portraying me and all the drama, and they they saw my strategies and the ideas that I was coming up with. Um, so that was really good. And the low was um. I don't know. Some of the contestants are just really jerks, and you know, it's a reality show, so they do want drama. But I thought some of them went out of their way to, to just flat out lie and uh, just be jerks for no reason. So I didn't get along with uh, quite a few of them. <laughs> like I, I've been tagged, and I just I remove my tag, and then I block them. <laughs> I, I probably I use. I'm probably not friends with anyone other than Joel and Eric, the producers, and then Charles Trippy. We don't really communicate, but I never really had a problem with him. Mm -hmm. I'm still subscribed to his YouTube channel. But other than that, uh, I'm not in contact or have any kind of relationship with any of them. Hmm. It was interesting. It was a good show. I liked it. It was very interesting. And uh, it, was edu you know, it was informative, too. You, know, you learned some yep. of the tactics. Um, so what, Jason, what should we leave people with final words? If they don't, you know, hear anything else, what should we leave them with, with, uh, for email marketing? Email marketing is testing. So don't speculate tests. Um, you know, clarity trumps persuasion. Um, 
don't trust anyone, even me. Test it for yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, focus on having a personal relationship versus just getting a bunch of random people on your list. Jason, fantastic, spectacular. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Hugely valuable. Definitely, man. This this was an interview like seven years in the making. Seven years in the making. I appreciate it. Glad we finally connected, man. Yes.